If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. And good evening and welcome to In Defense of the Faith. And uh, we have a really uh, great show for you in store. I'm here with David Krill. Hello. And uh, our special guest tonight, James White. Good to be with you. He's a good man to have on the program. Uh, He's written books, uh, uh, Letters to a Mormon Elder, uh, also uh, How to Answer Catholic Claims. And uh, he's just uh, pretty much a theologian. I would say, and it's a pleasure to have him on the program. Now, the format is uh, a little different tonight than usual. We have a debate in store, and we are going to have uh, Dr. D.A. Waite. Director of Bible for Today. Yeah, Director of Bible of Today, and of course, James White uh, is Director of Alpha Omega Ministries. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, give a quick intro, as we do every show. We tell you why a Christian should defend the faith, present the gospel, uh, which is the... um, uh, only way of salvation that God has for humanity. And uh, David, for our audience out there, uh, why don't you uh, tell them uh, why a Christian should defend the faith and the gospel? Well, uh, before Paul's life had, had, had finished in his preaching of the gospel and his uh, starting churches and delivering uh, what Jesus Christ had, had revealed to him, uh, false gospels had, has, had arisen. And even in Galatians, when he wrote the letter to the Galatians, he wrote in chapter 1, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him to call you by grace of Christ for a different gospel. So if Paul wrote that, we know that there's a one true gospel. And then all other gospels, as Paul goes on to say, are not really even another. Uh, they're a false gospel. And so most of the New Testament was written to, to exhort Christians, but also to uh, go against the heresies that had ar- arisen that Paul knew so well would come about. And so that's what we try to do. Uh, some people get very upset that we uh, name names and we, uh, we say what we believe the Bible says, and they just want to just all hold hands. Whoever says, I'm a Christian or says, Jesus is Lord, uh, should be off base. You can't touch them. But Paul, uh, he directly went after Judaizers. He went after the Gnostics, and and even in his letters, he named names. But there is a different gospel, and we believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can save. We believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that he died on a Roman cross for the sins of the people. He shed his blood for the sins, the Father uh, for the wrath, and and places imputed the sins to his son, Jesus Christ. He gave up his spirit, and he died. He was buried in the tomb and on three days he rose physically and he showed himself to be both Lord and Christ and we believe that the gospel is that you must repent of your sins and turn from your wicked ways and place your faith and trust a living trust not just a head trust but a living volitional trust in Jesus Christ and his merits what he's done his work on the cross he fulfilled the law he did not sin he was obedient to the Father, and by the grace of God, that you turn your faith to Jesus Christ and trust in Him, and God saves you. And then after that, the working of the Spirit begins to work in your life, and you become more like Jesus Christ until the day of the redemption of your body. And so we believe that Christ is the only way to heaven. There's no other that you're saved by faith, by grace, through faith in Him alone, and that uh, there's no other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. All right, thank you for that, David. And uh, that's right, the Bible plainly says uh, that many, many people will say, Lord, Lord, and uh, they will not be true Christians. And uh, Jesus said, uh, matter of fact, I'll just say, depart from me. I never knew you, never knew you. And so uh, we would uh, just tell you the narrow way, truth is narrow, and Jesus is the only way, and a commitment of your life to him is the only way that, uh, of salvation, where then if you are a new creation, you should so bear fruits 
of, of repentance. So uh, we encourage you to examine yourself. And if you're not a Christian, uh, listen to the program and you can call us up and uh, after this uh, debate here and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have uh, that maybe are keeping you from turning your life to Christ. Uh, we, have to, uh, we were told uh, to read a letter uh, from Tex Mars having to do with this controversy. Larry? You on the line? I sure am, Dale. Okay, we have our very own Larry Wessels uh, via telephone line, and uh, why don't you tell us what you got and uh, quickly read uh, the letter. Yes, uh, I had invited Tex Mars to debate James White in person, and this is his reply. Now, this is a debate uh, on the uh, on the, the Gail Ripplinger book, or what? Oh, yes, uh, I had invited uh, uh, Tex Mars to debate James White on the Gail Ripplinger book, New Age Bible Version. And uh, he sent this reply in the mail. I got it in the mailbox yesterday and wanted it read on the radio show tonight. So here's what Tex Mars has to say. He's written many books and is, uh, is director of Living Truth Ministries. Many people may be aware of him. Uh, Tex Mars says, I believe in debating to reach the lost, the New Agers, cultists, etc. Thus in the past, I have debated Satan worshipers and witches in Seattle, New Age psychics in Miami, homosexuals in New York, and even Lord Maitreya's forerunner, Benjamin Krim, here in Austin. But the Word of God, the King James Bible, is not up for debate. Regrettably, many fine and sincere Christians use the false new versions because they are unaware of the facts supporting the King James. They are unaware, too, of the hideous omissions and perversions of the New International Version, New American Standard Version, Revised Standard Version, etc. But Mr. James White is not one of the misinformed. He intentionally maligns the truth. Mr. White claims to be a Christian, but he eagerly defiles the Holy Bible. I will be pleased to debate Muslims, witches, Satanists, Scientologists, or atheists, but I do not wish to give a heretic the forum to blaspheme God's precious biblical truth. And that's what Tex Mars has to say. Okay. Well, thank you, and I'll be listening. All right. Thanks, Larry. Bye-bye. All right. Obviously, we don't agree with uh, Texmar's statement, but that's where he stands. And with that, let me bring on Dr. D.A. Waite. Hi, Dr. Waite. Are you there? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Anyway, what, what we're going to do is uh, give you uh, opening statements. Uh, we'll give you each uh, opening statements of uh, three or four minutes. Okay. And you may start, and then we're going to just have an open forum all the way to 10 to 5, then open up for phone calls. At the end of the debate, uh, we will allow uh, both of you to give your addresses and phone numbers. Okay. Okay? And all right. Same, uh, we've all both agreed that we each have the same number of uh, minutes and seconds to answer each question so that there's fairness and we will be able to speak uh, without interrupting one another. Certainly. Okay. Go, and and you, can, you can begin now. Uh, my turn? Yes, sir. You can begin with your opening statement. All right. Uh, I will, you want me to take about three minutes? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the opening statement uh, that we have to make would be that uh, I am the author of a book, we call it Defending the King James Bible, and we believe that the King James Bible has a fourfold superiority over all other uh, versions in the English language. We believe it has a fourfold superiority, namely it has superior texts of Hebrew and Greek, and we believe it has superior translators that translated it. We believe it has superior technique of translation, and we believe it has superior theology. We believe it's God's Word kept intact in English. And uh, we have outlined these points in our book, and uh, I believe that uh, these other versions, we believe, have a fourfold inferiority, whether that be, now I'm speaking basically and specifically of the versions that Bible-believing Christians are using today. I'm not uh, involved with the ones that the liberals are using. Uh, we could include those because those also are true uh, as far as the Revised Standard Version, New English Version, uh, and so on. But we're centering in specially on the ones that the King James people formerly used, and now they're using these other new versions, such as the uh, New American Standard Version, such as the New International Version, the New King James Version, and the New Berkeley Version. Those are the four that we cite in our book. And we believe that they're inferior on texts of Hebrew. They do not use strictly the Masoretic traditional Hebrew text. Uh, they say so in their prefaces. Uh, they use other things to correct the Hebrew. They do not use the received Greek text, the Textus Receptus, on which our King James Bible is founded, 
but they use the critical text based by um, Nestle Allen 26th edition or the 4th edition or 3rd edition United Bible Societies, uh, otherwise known as the Westcott and Hort text. They were the architects basically following manuscripts B and Aleph, the Vatican and Sinai. So that's, we believe, inferior as to manuscripts. Then we believe that they're inferior translators. We do not believe that our present men can hold a candle to our King James Bible men and their erudition and their spiritual insight and in their especially their equipment for knowledge of the Hebrew and cognate languages, the Greek and cognate languages, and of course the English language. The translation technique we believe is inferior in these other versions, which they use either to a greater or lesser extent, the dynamic equivalency, which adds to the words of God, subtracts from the words of God, and changes them. And then they're inferior in theology. Many errors in theological statement that are found. We have over 158 of those in our book. There are really over 356 doctrinal passages. So these are the four reasons for superiority of the King James and inferiority of these other versions. That's my three minutes. Hey, that's really good timing, Dr. Uh, Waite. Uh, now, so are you, you wouldn't, uh, you're not going so far as to say that these uh, other versions are of the devil or anything like that? Are you, are you in quite in that camp or... I think that the other versions of the scriptures, uh, I believe that they're made by men, uh, probably, of, uh, of uh, integrity and, uh, and fine uh, abilities and so on, but I do not believe that they're as accurate as our King James. Uh, but what their motivations are, I think some of the publishers now, I think their motivations are the dollar, the dollar sign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what well, the motivations of the translators, though, I, I wouldn't... Uh, I can't read their hearts and their minds, right. so I wouldn't know. I was just uh, wanting to know if you were in that extreme part of the camp. All right, uh, James, uh, your opening statement. Well, I appreciate uh, Dr. Wade being with us this evening, especially knowing how late it is back on the, <laughs> his, his part of the nation. Um, I believe that the King James only controversy uh, is based upon uh, normally a misplaced allegiance uh, to a 17th century translation uh, that certainly God has blessed uh, tremendously. If a person wishes to use that translation today, I certainly don't have any problem with that. Uh, but I do not believe that the King James Version is the most accurate version for today. And I do not believe that the, uh, especially the Textus Receptus, uh, called the received text that underlies the uh, King James Version, is the best Greek text that can be utilized today uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I am concerned when the King James Version becomes uh, a point of contention within churches, when churches are split over the issue of uh, whether one uses a 17th century translation done by Anglicans uh, or whether one uses uses a uh, 20th century translation done by uh, interdenominational scholars, I am very concerned when that becomes an issue of fellowship in the church and uh, when that then causes churches to uh, no longer be able to, for example, send out missionaries because people have left the church, uh, etc., etc. I see this as a, as a non-issue in the sense that I do not believe that there is any uh, conspiracy involved in new translations to attempt to uh, hide or deny uh, cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith, such as the deity of Christ or the physical physical resurrection of Christ or the virgin birth or any of these other issues. Uh, I believe that Christians should be avail themselves of all the information that is available to them, uh, that they should be aware of textual variation within the uh, Greek manuscripts, uh, and that they should uh, have a freedom to examine all that information, uh, and I think they would be best uh, suited by comparing a number of different translations, including the KJV. Uh, but taking a position that the KJV, I think, is the best, I think is somewhat untenable in light of mistranslations within the text itself and other things that have come to light uh, that even the King James Version translators didn't know about, such as uh, the Granville Sharp constructions at Titus 2.13 and 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. So I think these are issues that we need to, uh, we need to discuss and to, uh, to bring out. Okay, thank you for that. Well, uh, now that we have the opening statements, uh, let's just have an open forum and dialogue. And uh, I guess, uh, of course, you each person can clearly state their, their point, and uh, hopefully there'll be no filibustering, <laughs> but uh, we'll have a, a gentlemanly debate. And uh, who wants to start? Well, uh, I, I want to thank Dr. Waite for sending me uh, his book, uh, Defending the King James Bible. Uh, I've had the opportunity of looking through it, and... Um, uh, I just did want to ask him in, in light of uh, what he said about other translations on page uh, 125 uh, of your, your book. 
uh, you made the statement that, um, I'll just read it here, I believe the New King James Version is probably the most dangerous of the new versions on the present market today. And then just below that, uh, you also said in bold print, the diabolical nature of the New King James Version shows itself in their printing all the various readings of the Greek text in the footnotes. They print all sides and take their stand in favor of none of them. By so doing, they confuse the readers. And I was just wondering, I... Uh, I carry a, a New King James Version, and in fact, uh, the primary reason that I do so uh, is because the New King James does provide the textual footnotes. It does let the reader know, uh, because it's based upon the Textus Receptus, uh, obviously the reading of the TR is found in the, in the Bible itself, and then they give you what's called the majority reading and then the uh, NU reading, the uh, Nestle All and United Bible Society reading. You seem to to feel that they shouldn't uh, give you that information, and I'm I'm uh, my first real question was why why would you feel they shouldn't they shouldn't give that type of uh, of information in the footnotes? Okay, I'll take about the same time that you took to ask it to answer it, uh, Mr. White. I think that the information that they give in the footnotes is very misleading to the new Christians as well as to the older Christians. In the top of their text, they claim to use the Texas Receptus reading. In the bottom, they have a smorgasbord, a veritable uh, cafeteria of other possible readings. As you said, very honestly, either the NU, the National United Bible Society, or the M, the majority text readings. And so when a pastor is preaching from the upper top uh, then uh, and says, for instance, that the last 12 verses of Mark are genuine, Mark 16, 9 to 20, and then in the footnotes, uh, there is a caution that certain manuscripts omit these portions. There is a decided bifurcation of loyalty, <clears throat> either to the upper part or to the lower part. So I believe that's a serious situation. I believe the <clears throat> Nestle, or rather the New King James, for instance, in the edition that I have, page 1250, uh, see 1235, they say it was the... Uh, policy, let me just get that exact quotation here, just bear with me in a second, it was the editor's conviction the use of footnotes would encourage further inquiry by readers. They recognized that it was easier for the average reader to delete something that he felt, he or she felt was not properly a part of the text than to insert a word, phrase, or phrase which had been left out by the reviser. So, I believe that their motivation is to try to make people textual critics, and I don't believe that that's a part or necessary in the Word of God. And, of course, we could go on. My time is up on this portion, but I could go on and say that I've done a study on the New King James <clears throat> and found that there are over 2,000 examples of addition to the words of God, subtraction from the words of God, or changing the words of God. And I think that is a very serious thing as well. Maybe not as much as the New International, not as much as the New American Standard, which has 6,000 and 4,000 respectively, but it is in the wrong direction. I'm sorry that took me two minutes. So well, well Dr. Dr. Wade, I hope you won't... Uh, uh, uh I hope you won't cut your, your uh, response short uh, just uh, out of uh, a sense of making sure it's absolutely the same amount of time. I hope we can just have a regular uh, conversation here and, and do so in such ways to get all the information out. Um, but you just said that um, uh, changing God's words, that you, you use the King James as the standard for determining what God's words are. And you said you, you don't feel that people should be uh, uh, being textual critics, basically, uh, by having the information that New King James prints at the bottom of the page. Let me ask you, though, uh, if, if a person just has a KJV that has no textual notes, or if they have the Textus Receptus that is printed by the Trinitarian Bible Society, which also does not give any textual notes, uh, doesn't that limit them to having to believe uh, whatever uh, the TR says, uh, even when there are places in the Textus Receptus that are plainly in error due to the rush uh, that uh, Desiderius Erasmus was in to get his Greek text into print, aren't we, in point of fact, uh, telling people that they have to believe whatever Desiderius Erasmus said? Uh, wouldn't it be better to let them uh, have the information and, and make the decision for themselves? Well, <clears throat> Mr. White, just let me say First of all, I don't believe that the, the ground of the comparison where I said adding, subtracting, or changing, as in the New King James, some of the New King James, over 2,000 places in my book, uh, 
uh, number 1442, it wasn't based upon the King James. When I read through word by word the new King James and compared it, I did compare it first of all with the King James to see if there was an upset here and there, but I always went back to the original Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek to check and to see which was the closer of the two. So that's the first thing I would say. I don't also believe that there's <clears throat> errors in the Texas Receptus uh, because of haste. I don't believe Erasmus was the only one, of course, who was the pilot and the source of what we call the traditional text. Dean John William Burgon has written five books on textual matters, which we've published and reprinted in our Bible for today. And Dean Burgon feels that the traditional text, I agree with him, goes all the way back to the writings of Paul and Peter and James and John. And we have confidence in that. I was brought up on the Westcott and Hort text myself from Dallas Seminary. That was a text I was given to learn my Greek in. And uh, it, for 21 years, I was that way. The last 22 years or 23, I've been reading and studying, and I've come to a different conclusion. But Erasmus text was not the only Texas Receptus or traditional text uh, as at that time. As you know, there was certainly uh, the Complutensian Polyglot of Cardinal mm -hmm. Jimenez, who came out really first to print, or uh, rather to, to finish, but not to publish. And of course, you have the Elzevir brothers, and of course, uh, Biza in 1598, which is the form of the King James. So there are others. I don't think we have to be shut up to any Erasmian uh, quote-unquote errors. Well, the, the TR that uh, that you're talking about, uh, I'm assuming it's the same one uh, published by the Trinitarian Bible Society? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, does that not still, to this day, uh, for example, contain uh, Erasmus's uh, translations into Greek from the Latin Vulgate uh, at the end of Revelation? Uh, as well as uh, some of the importations that he made, like in Acts 8, uh, from the Latin Vulgate uh, into the, uh, the Greek text without uh, Greek textual support? Isn't, isn't that still a part of that uh, particular uh, uh, edition that is printed by the Trinitarian Bible Society? Well, in answer to that, Mr. White, the Erasmus last six verses, for instance, of Revelation, which he had no manuscript in the Greek, so the story goes, using the Latin, I compared, for instance, the, uh, the critical text that was used by the Revised Standard Version, and I looked at it word by word and read it from that and read it from the Texas Receptus that underlies the King James, and I didn't find more than two or three words that were out of place or different, and so I believe Erasmus was not the only one. I think he did a pretty good job of uh, translating it. I think Acts uh, 8, I think that that's got legitimate uh, standards and uh, standing with the many other texts and her early church father's quotation. But you, you will admit that there are words like uh, orthrenos at Revelation 22.16 that, uh, that basically he made up uh, as he translated into the Greek and they're still a part of the TR. You wouldn't defend them as being uh, God's words, uh, would you? Well, Mr. White, I go by faith in what God has preserved for us through the years, and as was accepted by the church, we have over 37 historical links in our book, as you notice, mm -hmm. down through the centuries, and also that which is uh, uh, accumulated and proved by the evidence that is before us, over 99% of the texts that we have, 5,210, go along with that text basically that underlies a King James Bible. Yes, and I believe that's uh, that's what God has preserved for us. Well, yeah, I I would agree. Uh, if you're talking about the majority text, uh, that that certainly has a deep historical roots. But uh, the specific readings of the Textus Receptus, such as the one I just gave you, at Revelation 22:16 or 22:18 or 22:19 or Revelation 17:4. Uh, Revelation 14.1, especially the book of Revelation, there are a number of problems where there is, there is no Greek manuscript support, and none of those readings existed prior to 15.16. The church had never seen Orthronos at Revelation 22.16 prior to, to uh, 15.16. So I, I don't understand how it could be said that the church accepted these things when the church had never seen these readings uh, in the first 1,500 years of its existence. Well... Uh, I don't think that our discussion should uh, center around one or two Greek words. I believe that the thrust of the text that underlies our King James Bible <clears throat> is the text that the early church copied and recopied, and the text that underlies these false versions, these versions that are not based upon proper text, is a 
text of the 4th century, they claim, 350, 375 A.D., and that text, basically the Egyptian text, doctored by heretics, Egyptian texts, uh, really B and Aleph, those two particularly that they almost worship, uh, those texts uh, were never copied and recopied by the church. Uh, there are measly 45 Greek documents, and that's as far as it goes, uh, B and Aleph and 43 others, and they have kept uh, themselves buried until Westcott and Horton, some of the others, unburied them and said, aha, these are the texts that the Bible, the New Testament, should be based on. And we believe that that is serious because the early church realized that there were forgeries and falsities and errors abounding in those two Egyptian texts, and they never copied and recopied them. Well, uh, Dr. Waite, certainly you're aware of minuscules that exist uh, long after the time of the uh, Egyptian texts that still uh, maintain the Alexandrian readings like 1739, 1881, and others. But uh, I... I I don't agree that these texts were, uh, quote-unquote, doctored by heretics or things like that. I certainly see no evidence of that when I examine the texts themselves. Um, I noticed that in your book, you do feel that there are a lot of theological uh, issues that are impacted by the textual readings that we choose. Uh, you, for example, noted um, when uh, the modern text will say Jesus and the uh, King James says Lord Jesus, that you feel that this is in fact a, uh, an attack or a denigration of, of his deity. Am I correctly uh, representing what you said in your book on that? Yes, I believe, <clears throat> Mr. White, I think that when these uh, Docetists or these Aryans or these uh, Egyptians, who all of whom were unorthodox in the, e the area of Egypt, even according to some scholars on the other side, when they came to these places, they often removed the lordship, especially Lord Jesus Christ. That was foreign to the uh, Gnostics. And so as far as the doctoring of the, of the, uh, verses, of the verses there, uh, Dean Burgon in his book uh, called Causes of Corruption of the Early Manuscripts uh, lists on chapter 13 quite a few of these heretics, the Gnostics, the Ebionites, Marcion, Tatian, Basilides, Valentinus, Serinthus, mm -hmm. Heraclion, Theodotus, the Manichaeans, Manus, all of these, in fact, they said the, the greatest heretics and the greatest corrections and corruption occurred within the first hundred years after the scripture was, was made. But sir, can you, uh, can you actually historically demonstrate that any of these uh, heretics had anything whatsoever to do uh, with what you would identify as the Alexandrian manuscripts? Well, I don't know by name. All I know is these men that were <clears throat> writing their own gospels, certainly uh, that's a, a, a change of the word of God. Marcion, for instance, A.D. 150, uh, wrote his own gospel and mutilated shamefully the mm -hmm. scriptures. Tatian and his Dia Tesseron uh, tried to weave the four gospels into one and thus polluted it. Basilides, he was a heresiarch, a lead heretic, wrote the gospel of Basilides, 134 uh -huh. A.D. And yeah. Valentinus, 140 A.D., uh, wrote his own gospel. Uh, these, uh, I can't pin down that this man or that man, for instance, took away the, the word Theos, God, in First Thessalonians or First uh, Timothy 3:16, but that certainly is a heretical reading, and it's certainly not a reading that ought to be accepted by the text that we have. Well, God sir, manifest in the flesh, not simply He appeared in the body. Mm -hmm. Well, sir, I, I would happen to agree with you that the best reading at First Timothy 3:16 is Theos uh, personally, but I don't see that uh, there is any theological reason to assert that someone, some scribe who saw Haas there, which is the other reading, was somehow a, a heretic. But I don't think I, I really got an answer to what I was saying earlier, and that is, while we all agree that there were heretics in the early church, I asked where you can demonstrate that these heretics had anything to do uh, with the writing of the manuscripts uh, that that are vilified by, by King James only advocates. In fact, the first one you mentioned, Marcion, you also mentioned Valentinus, they both flourished uh, in Rome, uh, not Alexandria, Egypt, uh, and hence could not one, if, if we're just citing names, uh, assert that uh, maybe that's why the Byzantine text does not contain the reference to the deity of Christ at John 1.18? I mean, could we not utilize that type of an argumentation? I mean, I wouldn't, but, but it, it would seem that if you're going to use that type of argumentation, it has to go both directions, doesn't it? Well, as far as First John uh, or John one eighteen, I believe it is inimical to the deity of Christ. The uh, the reading that the only begotten God. 
to have God, the only begotten, I believe, is a, is a travesty and a heresy and a theological perversion. I believe the only begotten Son is the proper reading. I believe it's a proper doctrine. And I think that uh, what you said about those heretics in Rome, uh, whether they're in Rome or where they are, uh, they had an influence in the early church in some of these versions. For instance, uh, if you take First John chapter uh, 4 and uh, verse uh, 3, 1 John 4 and verse 3, every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. The words Christ has come in the flesh is left out of Aleph, or rather B. There's no Aleph here in this portion. And I believe this is a great heresy. They do not uh, want to believe that Jesus Christ, perfect God, perfect man, is come in the flesh, uh, incarnate. And I believe that's the essence of 1 Timothy 3.16 as well. Um, you just mentioned 1 John uh, 4, 3. If I, if I just might uh, turn our, our reader's attention uh, to that, uh, you just indicated that uh, that phrase is not found in modern translations, and, and you're right, and you consider that heretical. Um, isn't it uh, significant, though, you indicated that these manuscripts did not want to believe this. Why then do they all include it in verse 2? the verse immediately before the one that you read, uh, which in all the modern translations um, speaks of the one confessing that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Uh, isn't it much more logical uh, to understand uh, that uh, the reason that the Byzantine manuscripts have this same phrase twice uh, was due to scribal error and not the other way around? And isn't it clear, no matter which direction you go on that, that since all the manuscripts at 1 John uh, 4, 2 contain that phrase, there obviously was not some sort of conspiracy to attempt to deny the wonderful truth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Well, in 1 John 4, 4 verse 2, by this know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of, uh, is of God, and every spirit that is not confessed is uh, not of God. Uh, I believe that wherever there is a wrong uh, doctrine, wherever there is heresy, I believe it should be included, whether it's twice, whether it's once. I don't believe that we say that uh, we can take out any portion of that which is solid and, and straight. Uh, the, I didn't name the versions that did remove Christ has come in the flesh, but uh, the New American Standard Version is one, and certainly New King James in the footnotes. I believe that we should uh, take, for instance, another example of heresy and uh, theological uh, error uh, in, for instance, in uh, John chapter 7 and verse 8, where the Lord Jesus is made out to be a liar by Aleph and by the New American Standard Version. I believe this is serious uh, heresy against our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us. Well, uh, sir, uh, again, uh, if you're asserting that there is some um, heresy on the part of these manuscripts, uh, when you have the phrase, Jesus has uh, come in the flesh, right there in verse 2, obviously, if someone wanted to take that doctrine out of the Bible, then they would take it out of the Bible, but they didn't. Uh, in John chapter 7, uh, what, you're, what you're talking about here, uh, again, uh, it is not calling Jesus a liar to take out the word yet uh, going up to this feast. Uh, that can be understood very plainly uh, in other ways other than calling Jesus Christ a liar. There would be no reason for anyone to attempt to do such a thing, but there would be a very good reason why later scribes would want to put that word yet in so they wouldn't have to explain uh, why Jesus put it the way that he did. Again, one can understand the situation here without resorting to uh, some sort of uh, theory uh, that certain manuscripts are somehow attempting to um, uh, insert heresy. But you did just say something that, uh, that intrigues me. You said that whatever is, I think you put it, fuller or, or more strong in, in solid doctrine, that that's the reading that we should, we should go with. L let me uh, ask you uh, possibly about another passage and see what your opinion uh, on it is. Um, in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 25, in the King James Version, uh, Acts 4, 25, we read the following. Who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? 
Now, the uh, New American Standard uh, Bible at Acts 4.25 says, Who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, thy servant, did say, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The um, modern translations uh, teach very clearly here the role of the Holy Spirit in the inspiration of the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, could not a person, if they're using the same um, methodology and argument that I'm finding in, in your book, uh, say that this, at this point, the modern texts are superior to, in both text and translation, to the King James at Acts 4.25? Well, uh, Mr. White, uh, you said a number of things in this last uh, question. Uh, regardless of Acts 4.25, I believe we ought to leave it the way the text of Receptus has it and the King James has it. I'll let the readers, to, or rather the listeners, to decide as far as the John 7, 8, uh, whether Christ is made a liar or not. Uh, here it says, go ye up into this feast. The Lord Jesus in John 7, verse 8, was talking to his half-brothers. The feast was at Jerusalem. And he said, I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet come, full come. But Aleph, uh, Sinai manuscript, there's no B here in this area, but... They remove the one word, yet. And so does the New American Standard Version, so does the New King James in the footnotes, suggesting that we ought to take that away. I'll leave it to the listener's uh, discretion to see whether or not uh, the Lord Jesus says, I go not up into this feast, uh, and yet he went up uh, afterward, and if he says, I go not up, uh, that would make him a liar, wouldn't it? And uh, regardless of what you say, that the, you say the scribes added this or added that. I'm pointing out their theological errors in these versions and their superiority in theology in our King James Bible. Well, sir, uh, the going up to the feast, uh, if you're familiar with, with that situation, uh, as I taught through the Gospel of John over the past couple of years, uh, I explained that, and I think it's a very logical explanation, that when Jesus says, I am not going up because my time has not yet fully come, he's talking about the public displaying of himself uh, to the people of Israel. He went up, as the book of John says, secretly and not openly. And hence, there is a perfectly logical, exegetical reason uh, for the reading that is found in, uh, in the manuscripts upon which the new translations are based, and there's no evidence that they're attempting to uh, cause uh, Jesus to be called a liar. But you said you, you feel in Acts 4.25 that uh, you should just stay with the Textus Receptus. Um, Again, why, why is that the case? Uh, do you feel that you should stick with the Textus Receptus uh, even when it uh, goes against, for example, the majority of Greek manuscripts? And if so, why? Well, the Textus Receptus that underlies our King James Bible is the basic text of Beza, 5th edition, 1598. And uh, it's been, for two reasons, it's been accepted by the church down through the centuries, and it's been attested by the evidence. And I believe the early church in the apostolic times, we list over 37 historical uh, links with the text receptus in the early churches right down from the beginning. And I believe that uh, that's the first reason. The second reason is that it's been attested by the evidence. Uh, over 99% uh, over of the manuscripts that we presently have uh, are underlying uh, the King James Bible. The papyrus fragments, uh, 85% of those are, go along with the King James. Unchils, the big ones, uh, over 97%. The cursives, over 99%. The lectionaries, 100%. Uh, that's over 99% of the whole manuscripts that we have. And I believe, by faith, that we have in this Texas Receptus, the Word of God, that the Church has accepted. If you reject the received Greek text that underlies the King James Bible, what you're saying is the Church had no real Bible mm -hmm. in the 4th century, until uh, 1900, 1,500 years of the false Bible. I don't believe God uh, works that way. He promised to preserve his words. I believe he did in the Hebrew Masoretic and the Greek Texas Receptus. Uh, but, sir, uh, you're, 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 you're making an error there in, in that I asked you uh, when the TR varies from the majority text, uh, when you talk about texts going back to the early church, you're talking about the majority text, not the TR, not the specific TR where it differs due to Erasmus's mistakes or whatever uh, from the actual majority text. You're, you're, at one point you defend the TR, and at the next point you're defending what's actually the majority text, and they're not always I identical to one another. I I have an entire list of readings where the uh, TR is very different from the majority text. And so uh, I again have to ask, when 
Uh, when, let me give you an example. Maybe that maybe it'll help if, if I have an example for us to uh, to look at. In Second uh, Timothy chapter two, uh, verse nineteen. Uh, we have a, a passage where we have a quotation from, uh, two quotations from the Old Testament. The King James says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, uh, maybe you know otherwise, sir, but uh, to my knowledge, I have not been able to find a single Greek manuscript that says Christ at this passage. Uh, the majority text reads Lord. Uh, all of uh, the Nestle Elan, UBS reads Lord. All the unseals, all the minuscules, all the lectionaries, they all read Lord at this place and not Christ. And so maybe, the, maybe this will help us to, to get the question more clearly. Why should I believe that the re correct reading here should be Christ, when to my knowledge, no Christian prior to 1516 had ever seen the reading Christ here. Uh, everyone had thought it said, Lord, uh, you just said, you know, if you reject the, the received text and you're saying the church didn't have a Bible until the 19th century, why should I accept the TR's reading at this point against all the Greek manuscripts? What was the verse? Second Timothy 2.19. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, again, the King James says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone, of, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If you'll look at the, um, at the uh, Hodges Farstad uh, uh, edition of the uh, majority text, it will indicate there uh, that uh, that reading is, is a uh, TR reading over against... Uh, um, pretty much everybody else. Uh, all the other manuscripts uh, say, Lord, uh, my, my feeling is it was just an error on Erasmus's part. He was in a hurry, just like Revelation 14.1. Um, but it seems to me that you're saying that because the TR was used for maybe, what, 200 years from the time of Erasmus onward, 300 years, uh, that somehow we should accept that reading even when it doesn't have any uh, Greek manuscript support. Well, let me just <clears throat> say a few words without getting specific on any verse. I think it's uh, not necessary that we go into verse by verse. Let me just say a little, think of something about the so-called majority Greek text of Hodges and Farstad or Robinson and Pierpont. There's two majority texts, as you know, floating around, vying for, uh, for power. I guess uh, Hodges and Farstad is not even in print, at least I guess it maybe has gone back recently, but it had gone out of print. Uh, there are great defects in this so-called majority text. They did not revise the Texas Receptus in the way that Dean John William Burgon suggested. Uh, they used uh, basically the footnotes of Von Soden. Uh, we have a booklet called Defects in the So-Called Majority Greek Text and also Why Reject the Majority Text. Uh, they used Von Soden's footnotes, and uh, he only had about 414 manuscripts total, and he called that the majority manuscripts. They did not look at all 5,255-plus manuscripts. They had a shortcut, uh, quick-fix type of a text. They realized and admitted that it was not really uh, sure. It's not anchored in rock. And uh, this, this is very serious indeed. Of course, von Soden was not a believer. Uh, he was an apostate. And uh, they followed uh, slavishly. Also, the majority text, although some of its leaders... Uh, Dr. Pickering, uh, for example, uh, he was writing that book, Identity of the Greek New Testament, a very good book, but uh, he was following Dean John William Burgon very, very strongly in that area, and Burgon, as you recall, was very much against the idea of families, and yet they pick up the family idea here. He also was against uh, the idea of intrinsic and uh, transcriptional probability, which was West Cottonhort's theory and, and completely, but yet they say if we do it right, we'll have a transcriptional or uh, intrinsic probability, and we'll use our uh, efforts on that line. And um. then uh, the idea of families, uh, Burgon said uh, instead of having families for uh, the woman taken in adultery, John 753 to 811, <clears throat> or Revelation, mm -hmm. uh, we should remember that families are not uh, true in the Greek text. Every text is an individual. They stand or fall with very few exceptions. They're like going into a graveyard with 5,000 unmarked graves, for example, and uh, nobody can say this one is related to that one or the other one because they're unmarked. And so uh -huh. I, th I find great serious... Uh, defects in the so-called majority text. They did not use all of the cursives. And they did not use all of the uncials. They did not use any of the lectionaries. They did not use any of the uh, quotations of the church fathers. 
They did not use any of the early uh, <coughs> translations of the Bible and early versions, so they're faulted for many reasons. So I don't trust the majority text. Well, Doctor, if, uh, if, if you don't want to get uh, specific, though, in, in answering my question about 2 Timothy uh, 2, uh, 19 on the, on the basis of the text, perhaps we could turn our attention uh, for a few minutes to uh, your assertion that the translation of the King James is uh, superior in all respects. Uh, there are two questions that I would like you to address, if, if you would, and please you know, take the time to, to, to fully do so. Uh, I would allege that there are two... Uh, very important mistranslations in the uh, King James Version of the Bible. Uh, I would allege that Acts chapter 19, verse 2 is mistranslated. It reads, He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Uh, if you could comment, sir, in light of your uh, academic training uh, in the subject uh, of the Koine Greek of the New Testament in regards to the translation of Acts chapter 19, 2, specifically the Aorist participle pistusan tests at that particular point, I'd appreciate it. And the other issue, in light of the scholarship of the King James translators, which is acknowledged by all, is uh, what is called the Granville Sharp constructions at Titus 2.13 and 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. In Titus 2.13, we have the great God and our sa the great God and Savior Jesus Christ, which in the KJV is the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And the similar construction at 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, our God and Savior Jesus Christ, there being five Granville Sharp constructions in 2 Peter, the King James properly translating the other four, but not the first. Uh, if you could comment on the fact that the Granville Sharp construction was not yet understood at the time of the King James Version translated, uh, in light of the, your assertions in your book, uh, that would be very helpful. Well, I would <clears throat> believe very strongly, uh, Mr. White, that the King James Bible is much more accurate than these other versions that we call perversions. They follow a verbal equivalence and a formal equivalence from the Hebrew into English, Greek into English, not a dynamic equivalence, which these other versions do to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, for instance, they want to bring the very words over from Hebrew to English, the very words from Greek to English. These other versions feel that they can uh, play fast and loose with this type of thing and have dynamic equivalents. That is, they can feel they can add to God's words any time they want to. They can subtract from God's words any time they want to, or they can change God's words any time that they wish. As far as the Acts 19.2, Again, I think it'd be unwise for us to get into great syntactical, heuristic uh, attacks one way or another and translations and so on. As far as Second Peter 1.1 1, 1 and Titus 2.13, the Granville Sharp rule, I believe, was fully understood. They may not have called it the Granville Sharp at that time. Obviously, it wasn't alive. But uh, uh, the God and Savior, Jesus Christ, as you well know, uh, Mr. White, the word chi there in the Greek language means not just only and, but also even, even Christ, uh, equating them. And so uh, the use of the and there is certainly not minimizing the fact that it is both the God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, either in Second Peter 1.1 1, 1 or Titus 2.13. But this, uh, as I said before, on the translation accuracy of the King James Bible, the NIV boasts itself in saying we want to be accurate uh, to the thought of the writers. Well, the King James Bible translators uh, wanted to get the words of the writers. I would just like to uh, mention to our listeners the battleground that we're facing in the entire attack in our New Testament area. We have the Texas Receptus with about 140,521 words. An average uh, text would be 647 pages. Uh, Westcott and Hort, uh, back in 1881, undermined that received Greek text in 5,604 places. Uh, the majority text, so-called, undermines the text receptus in 1,800 places. Not as many as 5,604, but those changes include some 9,970 Greek words by actual count. I've counted them myself. At 9,000, that's 30 words short of 10,000 Greek words. Now, these are Greek words that by Westcott and Hort, because of their adherence and worship of Vatican and Aleph, a Sinai manuscript, B and Aleph, those two uh, Egyptian manuscripts that, by the way, contradict one another over 3,000 times in the Gospels alone, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 3,000 places alone, because of their worship of B and Aleph, they have perverted the historic, Greek New Testament text 
in 9,970 Greek words. Either they've added the Greek words that shouldn't be added, they've subtracted from the Greek words that shouldn't be, or they have changed them in some way. This is 15 words per page on the average of a Greek New Testament. That's 7% of the words in the New Testament. And if you put all of their additions, subtractions, or changes, these 9,970 words in one place, you'd have 45.9 pages, almost 46 pages of the Greek New Testament that would be altered in some way. And these do uh, affect doctrine, theology. Uh, we got a few of them in here. Uh, we could take others, and we hope we will before the night is out. Uh, but these uh, heretics, Westcott and Hort, who changed these, and they were theological heretics. We have a book that we've written, The Theological Heresies of Westcott and Hort, and we give over 125 quotations of their, from their own books, three from Westcott, uh, the Gospel of John, the Book of Hebrews, the Epistles of John, two from Hort, Second Peter, Revelation, and we show their heresy in various theological areas. We also have written a book on the uh, Westcott's clever denial of the bodily resurrection of Christ. We analyze two of Westcott's books, but these heretics have doctored the Word of God, and we <coughs> believe we should stand on the historic Christian faith and the traditional text that underlies our King James Bible. Well, I would say in conclusion that I stand on our historic Christian faith, and I don't need to do that with the Textus Receptus, uh, which was collated by a Roman Catholic priest who, who made errors in the process. I think that we have seen this evening in, in our conversation uh, that there have been many assertions made, but no proof provided uh, in regards to these uh, various assertions that have been made. Uh, I have brought up passage after passage, uh, 2 Timothy 2.19, Acts 19.2, and uh, these issues have, have not been addressed, and I think people can, can hear that. Acts 19.2 is a mistranslation in the King James text. Uh, anyone who is familiar with the Koine Greek uh, is aware of the fact that you cannot translate a parsable the way the King James Version did. It's, it's an error. Uh, it's been fixed in all the modern translations. Uh, secondly, the uh, modern, uh, the uh, Nestle Alon text, uh, the UBS fourth, is not the Westcott and Hort text. Uh, anyone who asserts that it is is in error. Uh, there are many, many, many changes between uh, these two texts. Uh, and since they do give full uh, readings at the uh, bottom of the pages, the person has the uh, ability by doing a little bit of work uh, and a little bit of homework to uh, determine their readings for themselves. And so uh, I, I do not believe uh, that we have heard any evidence uh, that would really substantiate uh, the claim that the King James Version is superior to all of the translations, either in text uh, or in translation this evening. And I would encourage people to uh, look up the passages that have been referenced uh, and to ask for documentation uh, of the assertions that are made. I think that's extremely important uh, that we do that uh, because we as Christians, um, we need to be people of truth. We need to love the truth. But I think we need to be very careful about limiting God's truth to a 17th century Anglican translation of the Bible, uh, whose New Testament was based upon uh, the text that was initially collated by a Roman Catholic priest who was in a hurry to get his text out uh, before the Complutensian polyglot came out. Uh, I don't think Erasmus would ever uh, tell anyone uh, to believe that everything that he wrote was uh, somehow inspired or inerrant in and of itself. Uh, and I do not believe that he would be a King James only advocate today if, if he were alive. Uh, so I, I think the issues have been made, uh, made very clear this evening. Dale. Yeah. Okay. Uh, these are the concluding statements, and uh, we are now going to open the phone lines uh, again. Uh, our number is 447 5495. 447 KIXL, and you can call up and uh, talk about the King James uh, controversy for or against it and uh, what you believe on that. We have uh, two experts in the field, and uh, with that, let's go to our first caller. We have Tex Mars. Tex, are you there? I am, Dale, and uh, it's been good to hear your voice on the radio. Well, thank you. Okay, and your comments to, uh, uh, to the debate here. Yes, Dale, I, I just want to compliment uh, Dr. Waite on uh, defending God's Word, the King James Bible. Uh, I did, uh, maybe he could let people know how to get his book, because I have a copy of it, and it's tremendous. My, my specific question, uh, and one of the things that, that I'm heartbroken about the new versions and what they've done uh, to pervert uh, God's Word, uh, two in specific, uh, three things that's, uh, specific maybe Dr. Waite could comment on. Is it true, Dr. Waite? that the new versions have totally eliminated the, the, the statements by Jesus, for example, get thee behind me, Satan. Another one, when Jesus told us to take up the cross 
and follow me. Uh, evidently, those are missing from the new versions. And also, what about the Lord's Prayer? Uh, I, I recently read the NIV, the NAS, uh, the, the two versions of the Lord's Prayer. I found out that uh, they were horribly gutted, and entire lines were totally missing in the new versions. And maybe you could comment on that. Okay. Uh, I'd be glad to comment, and of course Mr. White would want to comment equally. Uh, the statement, uh, uh, Brother Mars, as far as uh, the take up thy cross and follow me, uh, it is eliminated in one of the Gospels in the Westcott and Hort type text, the Nesalalem text, be an Aleph text. It is, however, found in some of the other Synoptic Gospels, but at least in that area, that one portion, it is uh, taken away. As far as the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. There are certain parts of it that are omitted. Uh, there's no question about that either. And as far as the other one, uh, get thee behind me, Satan, uh, that is left out also in that portion of the, of the gospel there. And certainly uh, we feel that the King James Bible uh, is superior in the keeping of these areas and these portions that uh, are in line with the truth and in line with doctrine and in line with correctness in all ways. Well, I would like to comment on each of those in regards to Get Thee Behind Me, Satan. It is found, of course, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23 in the New International Version. Uh, Mr. Mars, when you were on KXEG last week uh, commenting on the Lord's Prayer, you were referring only to the Gospel of Luke. Many of the things that you said were deleted are actually in the Gospel of Matthew uh, and uh, were not actually taken out. Take up the cross occurs uh, four times in the King James Version. It occurs three times in the modern text. The only place where it's removed is Mark 10, 21, uh, because it's not in many of the early manuscripts. And interestingly enough, it is not in the parallel passages where Matthew and Luke record the same instance as Mark 10, 21, specifically Matthew 19, 21, and Luke 18, 22. Uh, so there is very good reason why it is not found uh, in many of the modern translations. Uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Mars, um, if 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 uh, is, is indeed found uh, in your Bible, uh, where it talks about how we're to address these particular issues of uh, how we're to uh, refute those who contradict us, the scripture says, and the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Uh, when I sent you information on, on the errors in Gail's Rippling, Gail Ripplinger's book, you wrote me a letter back that began, don't write me again unless in sincere repentance, you are a devil, plain and simple, and I understand well why Mrs. Ripplinger does not respond to your ridiculous assertions? Why dignify the lying claims of a servant of Satan? Uh, would you maybe explain uh, why you would identify someone as a devil and a servant of Satan in light of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26? Because, James, you are attacking the Word of God. Uh, also because what you have done, uh, for example, is name your ministry Alpha and Omega, and yet in Revelation 1.1, some of the new versions take out the words Alpha and Omega, and yet you have the audacity to give your ministry that name. And by the way, uh, text, before, well, you, you text, asked me a, a question. Could yeah, I answer uh -huh. it? Well, I just wanted to well, correct what you had just... Well, answer the question, my friend. I just wanted to correct well, what you had just said. You're, you're confusing you're, you're people. Saying, it's not Revelation well, text. It's no, not... I'd Re like to answer your question, James. Go ahead. All right. As far as you're being a researcher... Uh, I received your treatise about Gail Ripplinger's book, and I noticed you misspelled her name throughout it. Uh -huh. If you can't spell her name right, and all you had to do was call her up or call me or call any one of a thousand bookstores that have her name, if we can't trust the fact that you can't even spell an author's name right, how can we trust any other supposed scholarliness? Uh, and text, by the way, text, I read your 40-page uh, uh, missile, but it was, it was full of errors, uh -huh, and uh -huh. I really think that you need to get down and read some books, Dr. Waite's book, Dr. I uh, have, sir. I Fuller, have. Uh, Fuller's book, uh, uh -huh. Ripplinger's book, excellent books, and they're much needed by Christians today. Uh, well, Tex, if I could point out a few things. First of all, it's not Revelation 1.1, it's Revelation 1.11 that you're attempting to refer to there, and I provided you a full response to that in well, the letter. Sir, sir, now I'm, uh, sir, I'm going to answer your question, Tex, I'm going to answer your question now. Revelation 1.11, not Revelation 1.1, uh, and I explained that, excuse me, it's Revelation 1.11. That's what I said, Revelation 1.11, Revelation 1.11. <laughs> Actually, sir, on the front of the last letter you sent me, where you sent back my fax with red lighting on, red, no, listen, excuse me, text, text. No, sir. There has been I'm, no moderator to this debate. 
debate tax. I guess, are you trying to take over the no, debate? Sir. No, your, sir, Tex, I'm just responding Dr. to your... Not me. Excuse oh, well, me, Tex. Uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm part of In Defense of Faith, and your Tex, you're going to have to let James respond now. You have to be quiet. They're going to turn well, no, you down. I, I, no, I, the I sir? Dr. Wade is the guy who yes. debated, uh -huh. not me. I'm going uh, I'm to uh, let you good men go. And, oh, okay. Uh, all the best to you, All right, that's fine. Tex, I have one question for you. Are you no, still there, gone. Tex? He's, he's gone. gone. Okay. If, if I could respond to that, uh, first of all, uh, I sent a letter uh, to Doctor to uh, Tex Mars explaining, uh, responding to his letter to me. He sent my fax back with uh, red ink across it, saying he didn't want any more of my evil trash. And interestingly enough, he just tried to say he didn't say Revelation one one. The front of the envelope has Revelation one one. Right here, I'll show it to you, written on the front, not one eleven. Uh, secondly, if, if I could finish uh, responding to what he was saying, uh, when he says I attack the Bible, no, I do not. I love God's word. I preach God's word. Uh, a couple of uh, you, uh, uh, Dale, were, were there today as I, as I opened God's word and, and uh, spoke that word. I love God's word. I do not attack it in any way, shape, or form, but I do attack those who would attempt to limit God's word to a 17th century Anglican translation. Uh, and that just simply is... Um, those are the problems with what Mr. Myers said, and you'll notice he did not respond uh, to my citation of 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 to explain why he would identify someone as a uh, servant of Satan. Uh, that is not how Christians are to discuss this issue. I have respect for a person who can handle a discussion of this issue on a rational basis without uh, resorting to names, uh, but uh, Mr. Myers obviously is not one of those individuals who can uh, deal with this issue. Uh, what he said about get thee behind me, take up the cross, the Lord's Prayer, in each of those things, Things, there are, there are, you know, we could have a good discussion on those things, uh, but he's in error about many of the things that he said. All right, Dale, I wonder if I might uh, have a few words. I've been quiet for about five minutes. Go ahead, go ahead Dr. Wayne. Okay. Uh, in regard, without getting into what was mentioned previously, in regard to the uh, get thee behind me, Satan, for example, that uh, portion of Scripture, uh, that is a scripture portion that is found, as you know, in uh, Luke chapter 4 and uh, verse 9, and that, uh, or verse 8 rather, excuse me, that portion of the Lord Jesus saying, and Jesus answered, that's all right for the text, was, and said unto him, get thee behind me, Satan, that's all taken out of B and Aleph, uh, the rest is in there, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, B and Aleph, the Vatican and Sinai, false Greek texts, on which uh, Westcott and Hort based their text, and on which the Nestle Island 26 edition and other editions based their text, and uh, Nestle, Eberhard Nestle of 1890s, uh, said that he picked three different uh, texts that he chose, and uh, he picked the Westcott and Hort, or he picked the Tregellis, or he picked the Tritchendorf, whichever was in the majority. So he did use Westcott and Hort's text, but that uh, removes, uh, that B and Aleph is removed there. And of course, the versions that follow this and take away also, uh, get thee behind me, Satan, are as follows. The ones that the Bible-believing people use. The New International Version drops out to get thee behind me, Satan, in Luke 4, 8. The New American Standard Version drops it out. New King James Version in the footnotes. The New Berkeley and uh, the others. Uh, I'm sure the liberal ones as well do that because they follow B and Aleph. And the same is true. Let me just, uh, one more word, and then I'll turn it back over to our questioners. And uh, the idea of uh, the Lord's Prayer uh, in Luke 11 and verse 2. Now, that's not to say other places have it, but he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father. Well, that's so far so good. But the words which art in heaven are removed. Uh, by the two Greek texts again, B and Aleph, that followed by these uh, new versions. The New International Version removes uh, which art in heaven, New American Standard, New King James in the footnotes, New Berkeley, and also, uh, hallowed be thy name, that's all right, thy kingdom come, is all right, but thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth, uh, at least as in heaven, uh, that is removed as well. Now, I'm not saying... All I'm saying is we have a theological battleground in the King James Bible as opposed to the new versions. The new versions definitely have theological heresies and errors that are in them. Uh, how they got there, uh, that's another debate. But uh, I might get back to Acts 19.2 later on, but that's, that's just a, a brief answer to our questionnaire. 
Well, again, uh, I think it's important that we recognize that when someone says something's been removed and they do not qualify it, uh, that can be very deceptive. Uh, and when someone says, for example, that uh, get behind me, Satan has been removed, uh, the obvious assumption on people's part is it's found nowhere in that Bible. That's not the case. And many of these alleged uh, omissions in the part of modern texts, in reality what they are is especially in the Gospels, you have what's called parallel corruption. When you have a certain phrase or word that becomes familiar to people in, say, uh, and this is very clearly seen in the Lord's Prayer in uh, between Matthew and Luke. Uh, you have things happening to where when someone gets used to the Matthew version uh, and they're copying gospel, the Gospel of Luke, elements of the Gospel of Luke, uh, then it becomes very easy for them to transpose words from Matthew into Luke to make the two sound the same. And this is why the modern texts uh, do what they do at these points. Again, there is absolutely positively no effort on the part of uh, any of these individuals to downgrade the deity of Christ or the glory of God or any of these things because they recognize the propensity for parallel corruption between the synoptic gospels. That there is, you know, people may believe that, but the question then becomes, why do they believe that? Uh, is it not, again, going back to this just overriding assumption that King James is right in everything that it, that it said? And I, I don't accept that. Okay. Uh, for, to that Dale, uh, uh, sure, uh, quickly though. Okay, quickly. I'll give a minute to reply. How's that all right? Okay. Uh, in the fact that the uh, so-called new versions do not uh, purposely uh, have false doctrine, well, mm -hmm. whether it's purposeful or not, all I'm saying is the bottom line is there is false doctrine. For instance, uh, wouldn't you say the assertion of the sinfulness of Christ would be a false doctrine? To me, that is. Be it Allah, Vatican and Sinai, they didn't care about his sinlessness, his impeccability. And the New International Version, New American Standard, New Berkeley, in Luke 2.22, that's the portion I'm speaking of, when the days of her purification, that is Mary's, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus. But the new versions, that is NIV, NASV, and B and Allah, Vatican and Sinai, remove her purification, Mary, and make it their purification, as if both Mary and Joseph and the Lord Jesus Christ needed purification. This yeah, regardless of the why of it, uh, questions the perfection and sinlessness of Christ. That's my one minute. Turn it back over to you, Dale. Okay. And, and just a very brief response. There is absolutely no logical reason in the world why having there would mean that Jesus was sinful. Uh, any more than Jesus being baptized by John meant he had to repent. Uh, the, the modern versions are very plain in presenting the sinlessness of Jesus Christ and to assume uh, because of the, the purification rites that that means that it's making him a sinner. Uh, I see absolutely positively no logical reason to follow that at all. Bill, let's go to Charles. Charles, welcome to the program. Hi, Dale. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Um, Hello. I have lots of questions that I could ask of Dr. Waite, but I guess the simplest place to start would be, is there an essential Christian doctrine peculiar only to the King James Version? Uh, would you repeat that to Charles? I didn't understand. Is there any uh, sinful doctrine? No, is there, is there an essential Christian oh, an, doctrine? Any central? Yes. Oh, any central doctrine? No, no, any essential. Essential. Essential doctrine? Unique, unique to the King James only, uh, to the King James itself. Uh, well, I don't know that there's any doctrine uh, uh, essential to the King James itself, uh, other than the fact that they did revere and respect uh, the words of God, and they did follow what they believed to be the proper Hebrew and the proper Greek text, and honored the translation, uh, translatus, transferring from Hebrew to English and Greek to English in a verbal way. I don't know uh, exactly what <laughs> what you're getting at. but uh, if, if I might, I think what the caller is asking is, is there any doctrine that is essential to being a Christian that is found only in the King James and not in the modern translations? Caller, is that, am I interpreting you correctly? That's hitting the nail right on the head. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I could say this, uh, Charles, in regard to the doctrine of salvation. Uh, there are so many, uh, see, every one of these theological, uh, what I believe, errors and inferiorities in these new versions that I've listed in my book, Chapter 5, every one of these, I believe, indicates a superiority in theology of the King James Bible. For instance, the very uh, means of salvation. Now, just because these 158, and Dr. Jack Mormon has listed actually 356 doctrinal passages where the Textus Receptus or the King James Bible Greek text varies from the critical text or the Westcott and Hort text or the B and Aleph, Vatican and Sinai 
uh, text, the false we consider to be false Greek text, we're not saying that there's nowhere found, but for instance in John 6, 47, this is an essential verse on how to be saved. And if you take the New International Version of the New American Standard and the New King James in the footnotes, that following B and Aleph, the Vatican and Sinai Greek manuscripts, you find a perversion of how to be saved. The Lord Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And that is a simple gospel truth that all of us believe if we're saved. Uh, but the new versions and the B and Aleph remit, omit the words on me. And so they read, Verily I say unto you, he that believeth hath everlasting life. It doesn't say the object of that belief, and that's very essential. The King James Bible does have it accurately in that one verse. That doesn't mean to say another verses, these other verses may not have on me or some other area, John 3.16, for instance, but they're defective here, and I believe that we've got to point these things out. We don't want our Bible to be defective in any verse. Okay, and my other question related to that. Uh, would deal with which version of the King James? Are you talking about the original one that included uh, the apocryphal books, or um, or are you talking about the the ones that have been printed since then, which don't contain the apocrypha? Well, uh, Mr. White, do you want to answer that first question? You ought to get equal time on no, that. You, you, no, he's, he's asking you. If, if there's a comment, I'll go ahead. And uh, I think it is important to ask you the question, which, which King James are we talking about oh, here? Right, I'm uh, glad to answer that. Okay. About your, your, you know, I wanted to get you comment sure, on that. Sure, I appreciate part. that. Thank you, sir. Uh, the, the King James Bible that we believe we should use is that which we have uh, currently. I believe it's, uh, for instance, the one in the old Schofield or any of these modern King James. Uh, the one without the Apocrypha, that uh, made itself very scarce, as you know, very, very soon in the uh, 1611 King James Bible. Uh, I did a study on the original 1611, uh, actually, translation. Uh, Nelson put out one in the English script. I have one in my basement, four volumes from the Library of Congress in the German script, uh, King James 1611. By actual count, there are only 421 uh, changes, that is, that I could hear to the ear. And of those between the 1611 and the current uh, King James Bible, only 136 were substantial changes, that is, adding an and or a but. I don't mean in spelling, or I don't mean in punctuation, but I mean uh, changes to the ear. I could hear toward and towards. I counted that in my 421. I could hear again, uh, 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 well, I can't think of the others. Uh, but I, I've heard several things that are very close. Uh, I could hear burnt and burned, and so I counted, amongst and among, lift and lifted. Uh, those are included in the 421. So I believe the King James we have in our hands today uh, is, uh, well, in all intents and purposes, identical. I do have this in research form. Uh, I've given that, and I'd be glad to have anyone who wants it to write for it. I just want to make one quick comment in regards to John 6:47 and the statement that was made about uh, the belief in salvation. Um, if you look at John chapter 6, verse 47, where the NASB says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Again, the question uh, that I have to ask is, is, is there anyone who can honestly uh, question what is being said here? Uh, the issue, again, is what did John write? And if the facts of the manuscripts demonstrate to us that John did not write believes in me, then no matter how true that may be, we don't want to add it to the Word of God. There is no one who's going to, be, who's going to question what is being said here, because if you look at John chapter 6, verse 40 in the NESB, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him may have eternal life, and I myself will raise, will raise Him up in the last day. Believes in Him. It's right there. The object of faith, the object of, of belief is, is clearly defined both before and after. There is no ambiguity as to what belief in John 6.47 means. And, and hence, uh, it is not a matter of, of uh, corruption. The question always has to be, what did the apostles write? And I think in this King James, or in, in, a, in a sense, the Textus Receptus argument we're having right, he, right here, the question I have to keep asking is, why should I believe that Desiderius Erasmus was somehow inspired of God to get everything exactly right when he himself denied that that was the case, which is really what I'm being asked to believe here well, in regards also, to that. Isn't that the position that the King James translators made a uh, point of in their introduction? 
Oh yes, the, the King James, uh, the, pre the translators themselves, <laughs> just to give you an anecdote, I, I, I mentioned to a King James only advocate recently, uh, I said, uh, which do you accept as the, as the true and infallible word of God? Uh, the 1611 version, the 1611 uh, marginal notes where they give alternate translations, or the 1769 edition that you're using now, uh, and his response was, well, uh, I've only got one King James Bible and mine doesn't have uh, alternate translations, so they must not have existed. Uh, the, the King James translators gave alternate readings. You don't give alternate readings when you think you're, you're inherently inspired. Uh, you're recognizing that you are engaging in the task of translation and that there are other possibilities for a proper way of translating something. Dale, okay, do you want Chuck, me to reply on that? If you'd like. Okay. I would simply say this. Though it is possible, certainly, to have alternative uh, understanding of certain Greek words or Hebrew words, every one of which has four, five, six, or seven sometimes nuances and separate meanings, yet I believe that the King James Bible translators did select at least one of those meanings, one of those nuances from Hebrew and put it into English or Greek and put it into English. There may be others, and I don't fault these other versions when they use a synonym here and there for this particular word. I'm not faulting them for that, but I do fault them when they add to God's words something that just is not in there at all or subtract from God's words and take them out as they're told to do in the book called the uh, Translating the Word of God. That's the primer for the translators where they have extrinsic arguments and intrinsic arguments and they're taught when they think there's a repetition why just remove the words of God. I believe that's what I'm talking about, not synonyms at all. Hmm. Well, Dr. Waite, this is uh, David, and I'm in the studio with the, in defense of faith, and I have something I'd like to ask. I've been trying to follow this, and you've been saying, I feel, I believe, and all those are very subjective. Uh, are you uh, trying to tell us and our listeners that the, the TR is the original autographs, the Word of God? All right. Uh, is the TR the original autograph? Uh, of the and Word do you of have God? any proof? Pardon me? And do you have any proof? Yes, uh... I believe that the Bible clearly teaches divine preservation of his words. Well, sir, that's not my question. I, no. just, I just want to ask you uh, very simply, is the TR the original autographs, and do you have the proof for that, or is that something that you feel and believe, uh, just a subjective feeling? Well, it's both. It's something I believe, and it's also something that's backed up by fact. Uh, first, I was backing up by saying the Bible preservation, for instance, in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, the Lord Jesus says, not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise pass till all be fulfilled. God has promised in the Old Testament as well to preserve his words to a thousand generations, Psalm 105, verse 8. The question is, where has he preserved them? In the what Hebrew text? What Greek text? And yes, I do believe by faith that the Texas Receptus that underlies the King James Bible, I can't prove it to anybody who doesn't want to believe it, but I believe that those words are the very words that Paul wrote, Peter wrote, James wrote, John wrote, and so on. And I believe that the, the Greek New Testament that we have that underlies our King James is that which God has preserved word by word. The same as the Masoretic Hebrew Old Testament text, I believe that God has preserved those words uh, word by word. Otherwise, I have no basis, I have no Bible. If I take away my base, what do I have? My foundation, see? So I have to have something to believe. I spent, as I say, the first 21 years believing Westcott and Hort was right. I've been studying the last 22 or three, and I believe uh, that the uh, Testament uh, speaks for itself. Uh, the proof of it, as I say, it's been authorized uh, down through the centuries uh, by the church and accepted by these uh, churches as being the Word of God, and it's attested by the evidence. Over 99% of the documents that we have are based uh, those on which we base our King James, and I believe that uh, those two things uh, are certainly uh, evidentiary, but uh, again, nobody can make any of us believe what we don't want to believe. So. Well, well I, I do, but I, I, I'm a kind of like a skeptic. I like to have some evidence, and, and I do believe we have the, the Word of God as, uh, as we have the majority text and TR and, and the uh, Alexander text, and we can uh, get the Word of God from that. But what I was getting from you, and, and just what was for me, I was listening very carefully, is that you, you say by faith. Uh, I've never seen one scholar 
uh, really say that they would say that uh, TR is the autographs. And so when you actually say it's the Word of God, you are doing it by faith. And I just want our listeners to know that because you're making a logical fallacy. You're assuming something you've yet to prove. And that's what I wanted to bring up. And I've been hearing that by faith. And, and you're, you're, you're casting down some people that, that read the NAS by saying TR is the Word of God, TR is the Word of God. And you have not proved that because you cannot prove it's original autographs. And that's all I was saying. And so we can go to the next call, but I thank you for letting me talk to you. Well, let me just uh, uh, comment briefly on your last statement, uh, sir. I would simply say, David, that uh, the idea of faith and belief, uh, I'm a Baptist preacher, and I must have the Word of God to preach. My, uh, my Lord, through Second Timothy 4, verse 2, said, Preach the Word. Kerexon ton logon. That's the motto of Dallas Theological Seminary, my alma mater. And... I've got to know what word I'm going to preach. And I've got to have a Bible I'm going to preach. I've got to have a Greek text, a Hebrew text, and then I've got to have an English text or a Spanish or French, whatever mm -hmm. language I am. And so uh, you may say, well, no scholar says that they believe that the text of Receptus has been preserved down through the age, ages, the particular one. Uh, maybe that either means I'm not a scholar or maybe that means that I'm one that has. But regardless, I believe you cannot uh, believe in anything. It's all by faith. How can we really prove the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Savior. See, we believe it, don't we? Well, I, Salvation I, is by... There's so much in the whole Christian faith that's by faith. Well, I believe we that... faith that, and not by sight. I believe we have the eyewitness reports and we have manuscripts that they wrote down and we have... 1500 I can go to and, and more and more I can go into that but I was just want to clear something up that it is by faith and 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 not by objective evidence uh, dr. Wade is as as one Baptist preacher to another I'm the son of a Baptist preacher who was a part of the GRB back many years ago uh, as one Baptist preacher to another Baptist preacher, I just want to make sure that you understand, sir, that I do believe that we have the Word of God. I do believe that God has preserved His Word. I believe the promises of preservation that are found in Scripture. Uh, I just hope that you can understand and respect uh, a fellow Baptist minister who feels that God has preserved His Word in a way different than having Desiderius Erasmus or the Elsevier brothers or uh, Stephanus uh, codify uh, His Word uh, in what became known in 1633 as the Textus Receptus. Uh, I believe that God preserved his word by immediately having it go to all the nations all across the known world. In fact, manuscripts being immediately buried in the sands all over the place uh, so that there was never a time in the history of the church when any one man or any group of men could gather up all this, the copies of Scripture and make wholesale changes in them. I believe that God preserved the text of Scripture in the same way that he uh, determined the canon of Scripture. He didn't have a bunch of men get together and take a vote as to what books would or would not. He led his church. He led his people. He didn't have angels with golden indexes or anything like that. Uh, he did it in a, in a uh, way that maybe to the world isn't flashy, but it's, it was God's way of doing it. And I feel that's the way he preserved the text, by having the text distributed all over the place immediately, there was no way that it could ever be gathered up and changed and corrupted by men. Now, we now have to deal with textual variation, but I want to make sure everyone understands that I believe that what we have in the Greek manuscripts today, without a doubt, contains everything that was written by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have everything that was said. We don't need a, a re-inspiration of it. God has preserved his word. I just don't believe that we should uh, assume that Desiderius Erasmus happened to get everything right on his first shot in trying to uh, collate that man those manuscripts. Well, David's waiting patiently for a long time, so we're going to have to go to him. Again, for our listening audience, we're uh, having an uh, open debate here, and you can call in at 447-5495, 447-KIXL. Join us, uh, ask these gentlemen questions about the, uh, is the King James only, uh, the only inspired Word of God? And uh, we have with us Dr. D.A. Waite and James White. And with that, let's go to David. David, you're on. Well, thank you. I've been enjoying your program very much. Thank you. I'd like to make three observations. I'm not a Baptist, number one. I have many, many friends who are. I have no particular quarrel with Baptists at all. I respect them in, in, uh, a great deal. Uh, my, I'm an Anglican, and my church happened to provide the Bible you've been talking about. And there's some things of which have not been mentioned that I think are very important. One is that most of the authorized version of the Bible 
what you call the uh, King James Version. Excuse me, Dale. Could he speak up just a little louder, please? It's hard for me to hear way over here in New Jersey. Okay. All right. Most Thank you. Most of the authorized version of the Bible, or the, what you call the King James Version, was taken from the work of William Tyndall, as, as you probably know, which was done almost 100 years before this. Tyndall's work and Miles Coverdale, Miles Coverdale, I understand, did the first complete translation into English, and the Bishop's Bible and the Great Bible were all consulted to come up with the authorized version in 1611. And the, the Greek and the Hebrew, which was consulted at that time, was the best available. The scholars at Cambridge, Oxford, and at Westminster uh, uh, took these, uh, these various versions in English and added and took the, the latest possible uh, uh, Greek and, and Hebrew and, co and came up with what they thought at that time, in the early 17th century, was the best that could be done. The, those of us who love the King James Version of the Bible like its, its marvelous uh, cadence and its, its beautiful language. It's probably the greatest monument to English prose that's ever been written. However, it has some grave deficiencies. Since it was done, there were earlier Hebrew and Greek texts discovered, which are more primitive, go back closer to the source, and, and those texts have been used since the authorized version to provide uh, uh, newer translations. The, the great work of the 19th century, the English Revised Version of 1881, was a great improvement over the authorized version. It eliminated a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of erroneous translation, a lot of just plain, just absolutely mistranslation. Then the ones that have been done since then have improved upon the predecessors. But I, I think the thing that, that most of us have to look to is when we read the, the, Holy, the Holy Bible, what we're looking to is inspiration, the Word of God to us today. And the Word of God comes through all of these translations, if we, if we want to hear it. Uh, there's very, very little difference in any the real meaning of any, any essential point of any of them. But when we look back to the authorized version of the Bible, it, it uses the, what we consider a more religious language. Uh, many people have commented that in referring to God and the Almighty and his, and his providential works, we shouldn't necessarily use the same sort of language we use in talking to human affairs. Well, David, is there a, is there a certain question you'd like to address to uh, either or both of the gentlemen? Yes, I'd like to know why we, we keep hearing this controversy about one over the other when it's uh, quite obvious to anybody who's done any, any, any reading that textual biblical criticism has advanced since 1611. I guess that question would be for Dr. Waite. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your call. Well, Mr. White, you want to go ahead first, and I'll take it last if you want. Well, uh, since we've done it the other way, sure, we'll, we'll take it this direction. Uh, yes, I think there have been advances. Uh, I think there have been abuses. Uh, I think that Westcott and Hort went too far one direction. Uh, the modern Greek texts, such as the Nestle Allen the 26th and now the 27th, just now coming out, uh, have corrected many of those abuses. I have collated a number of instances, uh, and if anyone uh, really is, is uh, interested in taking notes, and I imagine there probably are uh, some individuals out there that are, that are interested in these things, I just wanted to note real quickly, uh, if you're taking down passages and so on and so forth, a couple of places where the modern uh, Greek texts have uh, gone away from uh, the Westcott and Hort texts as soon as I can find them. These are not just merely uh, repetitions uh, of the Westcott and Hort text. I think there has been advances. The specific passages I was talking about would be uh, Colossians 3.6, uh, 1 Peter 1.22, Mark 9.42. Each of these gives you an example where uh, the uh, modern texts have gone toward a more Byzantine reading. Uh, and I think that that's good. I think more of a balance has been restored. Uh, but most definitely, uh, modern textual criticism is so far beyond Desiderius Erasmus's attempt to collate 12 manuscripts uh, in Basel, Switzerland, while he's uh, hurrying to get his uh, text out uh, as, as to boggle the mind. And uh, I think it is very important that we uh, do not allow an incipient anti-intellectualism uh, to sneak into our thinking uh, to where, if it's modern, it must be bad. 
uh, you know, there's, there's two extremes there. There are people who think, well, if it's new, it must be improved. That's not necessarily the case. And there are others who think, well, if it's new, it must be bad. Uh, we need to walk a, a, a line there, and I think everyone needs to be uh, students of the word uh, and look into these issues for themselves. That's why I like the NKJV, including in its footnotes, these various readings. It gives you data that otherwise you would have to spend a tremendous amount of time digging through Greek manuscripts to find. And I think that's a true advantage of those textual footnotes, not a cause for confusion, uh, but giving Christians information they need to uh, be responsible before God. Because I can't sit around and say, well, Westcott and Hort told me to do it, or Desiderius Erasmus told me to do it, or King James told me to do it. I can't put my, that's, that's a Roman Catholic concept in a sense of, of putting my responsibility onto somebody else. I can't say the Pope made me do it, or the Pope told me to do that. I, as a Protestant, and, and, and Dr. Wade is a fellow Baptist, uh, we believe in, in uh, the individual priesthood of the believer and the responsibility of my soul before God. And I can't uh, push my responsibilities off onto somebody else. Uh, I need to uh, be willing to do the work uh, and, and do some, uh, some study on my own. Dr. Waite? Okay, uh, almost three minutes. I'll, I'll try to answer that in three. Uh, the caller talked about the history of the King James Bible, and it was fairly accurate as far as uh, Tyndale and Coverdale and the Bishop's Bible and the early Bibles. And of course, they did translate from the, the Hebrew and the, uh, the Greek. They did have uh, the three different places, as he mentioned, the uh, six companies, two in each of the companies of Oxford and Cambridge and uh, the other one. I forget what was the other one. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, they did a good job, and, and he says, though, that we don't need it today. He says that everything is fine and uh, everybody has the same Bible and uh, we don't have to worry about uh, God's Word being in every version. Well. Uh, to the extent that there is an accord in certain verse or certain place, uh, yes, uh, we can say that that's fine. But there are discordant notes throughout all of these modern versions, whether they're the versions that we speak of that the Bible-believing Christians use, such as we've talked about tonight, New King James, New American Standard, New International, uh, or whether it be some of the liberal ones, uh, Revised Standard Version, New Revised Standard, New English Version, Jerusalem Bible, whatever. Uh, there are differences, vast differences. I think we ought to face it. The second thing the caller mentioned was uh, the praise of the English Revised Version of 1881, uh, where Westcott and Hort were on the committee. They were supposed to just have a few odds and ends of uh, sprucing up the English of the King James Bible, but instead they introduced an entirely new Greek text. And they were working on it for 30 years, from uh, 1851 to 1881. And uh, far from being the great improvement on the authorized version, uh, Dean John William Burgon, in his book Revision Revised, 500-some uh, pages, almost 600 pages, which we've reprinted, has an excellent analysis of this uh, English Revised Version of 1881. I'm glad the caller brought it up. Uh, this He takes apart, first of all, the English Revised Version itself. He likens the English Revised uh, versus the King James to a... A carriage that's going down a bumpy road, one that has no springs, whatever, but bump, 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 bump every bump, and the other that has beautiful springs. Of course, the beautiful springs are not the English Revised Version. They're the springless one, and the King James is the one that has the springs. Uh, he goes into the analysis of that English Revised Version, and secondly, he goes into the falseness of the uh, Greek text that Westcott and Hort have perpetrated upon the English-speaking world, and thirdly, in Revision Revised, he goes into the false theory behind uh, that Greek text. And one of the things is the oldest has to be the best. Well, the oldest doesn't have to be the best if the oldest has been corrupted by heretics and false teachers. And so I believe uh, we have that uh, argument that's uh, constantly made, uh, the oldest has to be the best. So uh, I would uh, rest my case with that. That's my three minutes, and I'll have to give it over to the other questioner. <laughs> Dr. Wake, Dr. Wake, could I ask you a question real quick? Uh, who is that? This is James White. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, Not today, Elf. He doesn't have any other callers. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just... I. Um, in what you were just talking about uh, in regards to these... Uh, to the heretics changing manuscripts and things like that, I, I asked you earlier... Um, let, let me just ask you again, and maybe you didn't understand my question, but what evidence do you have... Uh, that say um, manuscript P75 to, to get real specific. What what evidence do you have, or is it just your your faith, your feeling, that that manuscript has actually been altered by heretics? 
Um, what I, I've taught church history as as a professor, and 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 it's it's important to me uh, to un, to understand these things. And and I just am not familiar with any information whatsoever outside of just mere assertions uh, that heretics had anything to do with these things. Um, can can you give us any specific information indicating that like P seventy five has been altered by heretics? Well, I would simply say this, that uh, we are told by the ones that are do working in the Greek textual field that, uh, for instance, P70, whatever it is, 5 or 6 or whatever. P, P, P75, P75 is 75 one of the... P75 and also the, uh, the B, the Aleph, the Vatican, Sinai, these other uh, manuscripts that go along with them are Egyptian texts. Uh, in some of our research, we've come up uh, to people who and men who have written, and I, I would take their word for it, that the Egyptians who copied, the copyists that made these Egyptian texts, didn't even know Greek because of the way that they ended their sentences. They kept them, uh, as you know, they don't have any uh, you know, punctuation like we have here, as far as the uncials, capital letter ones. Uh, they didn't even know Greek. But as far as the uh, Greek uh, climate at that time, uh, the professor up there in Princeton, uh, Metzger, Dr. Metzger, in his book, and it's quoted, uh, by the way, in one of the books that we have, uh, talks about the false religions in Egypt. He goes into great detail, even though Dr. Metzger is not on my side as far as Texas Receptus, he would be on your side as far as the mm -hmm. critical text. But he says there is no known Orthodox Christianity in that day, those early days, in the early centuries of the Christian church in Egypt. And so I just simply say uh, Egypt in that early centuries, uh, those men were corrupting. They did have different gospels and they did have different texts. And uh, I can't put my finger on this verse and that verse. All I know is there are theological corruptions, uh, some 158, as I mentioned in my book, uh, very serious ones. And I believe the heretics did it. I, that's all I can say. Uh, Dr. Waite, if they didn't know Greek, how could they change the manuscripts? Well, they were told, if they didn't uh, know Greek, they were told what to write, what to copy, what not to copy. By who? Uh, they, by the ones that were in, in charge of them. Uh, the copyists working in the copy uh, areas were undoubtedly told, for instance, in Mark 16, 9 to 20, the last 12 verses of Mark uh, should not be copied because they didn't want those copied. However, they left, as you know, a, a space, a blank space, in either B or Aleph, to show that really their exemplar, the one from which they were copying, did contain that passage. But, but, so, but sir, how do, you, how do you know they were told this? Isn't this just supposition on your part? I mean, where, how, how can you document this? Well, that's supposition on my part. All I know is uh, the blank space indicates that uh, Luke began afterwards, and so we would just simply conclude, uh, like uh, some of those of you who are on the other side of the fence conclude all of your thoughts, we conclude our thoughts also. But uh, we have a serious difference in the Greek text uh, that underlies our King James Bible and those that underlie these new versions. And uh, I think theologically, uh, how do you explain, for instance, in 1 uh, uh, Corinthians 5, verse 7, where the uh, efficacy of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death and the substitutionary blood atonement is gone in B and Aleph, other than heresy. I don't understand it. And the New International follows like a puppy dog, the New American Standard, New King James Footnotes, New Berkeley. Uh, Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice, period. No, it's not, period. It's for us, in our place, in our stead. And if it's just sacrifice, for whom? We're lost, unless it's for us. And these are theological verities which are gone from B and Aleph. Now, you can explain it away and say, well, they weren't heretics, they were all right, they didn't mean to, just accidentally. All I can say is the bottom line is in the texts that you appreciate and, and go along with B and Aleph and the whole, uh, you know, the whole critical text and these new versions do have theological heresies in them, whatever explanation, heretics or otherwise. Well, sir, uh, again, since all those texts all say that Christ died for us in many other places, obviously there is no conspiracy here whatsoever uh, to somehow deny the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ since it is taught all through uh, B and Aleph. Uh, you find one place and attempt to extrapolate that out. Sir, that just simply isn't logical. That's not heretical. In, in point of fact, it's much more logical to understand that drawing from other passages in the New Testament where you have that, fr that, that phrase, who 
compare Hamon in behalf of us, that it would be much more logical to understand that a later text would insert it there to harmonize it with other passages than the other way around. Again, if you don't start with the presupposition that you're starting with, you never come to the conclusion you come to. Uh, I believe in preservation of the words of God, uh, and I believe that there are two senses of preservation. One, uh, Rosalie, is with a capital P, you might say, and I believe that God's words have been preserved in the uh, original Hebrew language, which God spoke, a little bit of Aramaic, not much, and the original Greek language. I believe capital P, preservation of those words, and I believe that they've preserved uh, in the Masoretic text that underlies the King James and the Texas Receptus that underlies our King James Bible. But I believe that there's a small, uh, lowercase word preserved that we can say concerning our King James Bible uh, in the sense that it preserves in the English language what has been given to us in the original Hebrew and the original Greek language. And so I, I would use that in a small p, preservation. It preserves the words, every word of the Hebrew into English and the Greek into English. And in that sense, it does preserve the words of God in the English language, just like if we use those same uh, Hebrew and Greek texts into Spanish or French or Russian, uh, they would be preserved in those languages. Okay, because um, I've been studying, and um, the Bible says in Second Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Mm -hmm. And so I figured, well, if the other Bibles have the Word of God in it, then they're inspired by Him. Uh, all right. Uh, I would simply say, uh, Rosalie, that in 2 Timothy 3.16 that you're saying there, all scripture, uh, which in the Greek is pasagraphe, all that which has been written down is uh, inspired by God or is given by inspiration of God, theopanestos, which is God-breathed. And I believe that God breathed out his words in the Hebrew and in the Greek language uh, in, the, in the first instance. And I believe that that's what is being referred to here. And those words properly translated by the King James Bible into English, yes, into other languages, yes. Uh, and those words are uh, translations, but the actual God's breathing of the words, he did not breathe them out in English or Spanish right. or French, but he breathed them out, I believe, in Hebrew, mm -hmm. Little Aramaic, and in Greek. I, I agree with Dr. Waite that, uh, uh, in fact, that's why I like the NIV translation of, of uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, Rosalie, is because that's exactly what it says. It says, all scripture is God-breathed. Uh, and I do believe that all scripture is God-breathed and that you can find accurate translations of that scripture uh, in uh, the modern translations as, uh, and in the King James. You can find God's word uh, in these translations. And I think the argument this evening uh, has to do with uh, whether you can truly find it fully uh, in, say, an NIV or an NASB, uh, which are different modern translations of the Bible, uh, or whether it's just the King James only. That's where the disagreements are are arising right now, and that's what we're discussing. But uh, I do want to make sure that you understand that someone who uses like the New King James Version or the New American Standard can believe, and we do believe, uh, that God's Word is fully inspired, that it is God-breathed. Uh, you can believe that and still use those translations. Well, I, I read King James, and I was just kind of curious. Okay. Thank well, thank you for your call, Rosalie. Bye-bye. And Phil, you're on. Been a call. I heard Tex Mars uh, call in, and, and I've admired some of his writings, and and, and the accusation that he made against James White just kind of is, con is contradictory. You know, to, I know James stands in y'all's camp, and y'all in his. Well, I know that James White holds hand in hand the doc the same doctrines that in defense of the faith team holds to. And I was calling the, about the, uh, the uh, when Tex Mars calls, and he claims that, that James White is the devil. I mean, this is exactly what, what, what Satan himself does. I mean, he accuses. But, I mean, I want to go in gentleness here. I, I'm, I'm questioning Tex Mars' his credibility when he calls in his discernment. If he doesn't know a Christian from, from a non-believer, and, and I do question exactly what Dale asked. He said, what church you go to? I want to know if he's a submissive. Uh, servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, if he's if, if he's in a, in a church and if he's submissive to someone. Uh, I've bought his books, I've read some of his material, and now I'm starting to question him. Uh, my discernment bells are going off, and I want him to get back on the air and address these things. 
Um, I appreciate uh, the call, Phil, and, and uh, I think we certainly welcome that. Uh, your call did remind me of something, though, and, and uh, not to take away from the importance of what you just said, I think it's extremely important to be a member of a local church. I am a member of the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. Uh, I have a pastor that I'm responsible to there. I think it's extremely important that we all do that because it's real easy when you get into apologetics to sort of go off on your own horse and uh, uh, just sort of uh, think that you're out to save the world all by yourself and ignore what the New Testament says about being a part of the local church. Uh, and I think that's, that is important. But you did remind me of something when you called in, in, a, in, in the rush when the Mr. Myers was on the air. Uh, he did say something that I didn't respond to. Uh, and that was he attacked my credibility by pointing out that uh, I misspelled Gail Ripplinger's name in the first draft of the paper that I wrote. Uh, what most people don't know uh, is that the book that she wrote, uh, she used only the name G.A. Ripplinger. Uh, she nowhere indicated either that she was a woman uh, or what her first name was. The only reason I knew her name was Gail was because I was on a radio program with her and the host called her Gail. Well, when I wrote my uh, paper and I used her first name, I had to guess, well, how do you spell Gail? Since she only put G.A. Ripplinger in her book, how do you spell Gail? I guessed G-A-Y-L-E. I later found out the, from someone who had gotten a letter from her that she spelled it G-A-I-L, and so I made a correction in all the stuff that I had written to G-A-I-L. That, if, if that's the basis for calling someone a liar uh, and a servant of Satan, I think someone has a, a rather poor basis for that. But I did want to mention one other thing in regards to Mrs. Ripplinger's book. She didn't put her first name in it, and there's a reason. I want to quote from a, uh, the End Times and Victorious Living newsletter where she talked about why she wrote her book. And she said, daily during the six years needed for this investigation, the Lord miraculously brought the needed materials and resources, much like the ravens fed Elijah. Each discovery was not the result of effort on my part, but of the directed hand of God, so much so that I hesitated to even put my name on the book. Consequently, I used G.A. Ripplinger, which signifies to me God and Ripplinger. God as author and Ripplinger as secretary. This is the book that Mr. Mars is defending, uh, which uh, I have documented is, is filled with numerous errors. And here you have the author saying that uh, she specifically did not use her first name because G.A. Ripplinger signified to her God and Ripplinger, uh, which is an amazing thing to me. Well, I, uh, Dale? Make it, no, I just wanted to, I mean, I, I'm not trying to get all puffy here, but I would just like this man who I've read his books and I, I admire to some extent, Get back on the air and address these things. All right, if I may reply, uh, Dale. Thank you, Phil. Uh -huh. all right. Go ahead. Uh, all right. Uh, let me just take uh, the amount of time, uh, about two and a half minutes or so, uh, rather than to go into the personalities, I'm not uh, wanting to get into either Mrs. Ripling or, uh, or Mr. Martin. Well, Dr. Wade, we do but, have two other callers uh, wait. In fact, we've, we've just got caller after caller waiting, well, me, and we're running out of time. Let me just respond in the same amount of time that, I, that uh, Mr. White took, if that's all right. By saying that the, one of the arguments uh, against uh, the King James Bible, for example, by the New International is that the New International is more readable. Uh, my son uh, has got an excellent uh, research on the different reading uh, uh, readabilities of all five or six different versions. He's taken every one of the 1189 chapters by computer, flesh reading ease, and we find that the King James Version is superior in many areas as far as being easier to read than the NIV. Uh, in the 52 chapters, it's very easy, the King James. Now, I realize NIV 81 chapters, easy, 548 to the King James, 531 for the NIV. But Dr. Uh, Wade, we, we weren't really addressing that topic, though. We're talking about text Mars. Well, I realize, but uh, I just felt that we should get equal time with uh, whatever the other Mr. White has talked about, and I wanted to address the subject that is our theme tonight, the King James Bible, versus uh, those that... <laughs> well, you could, if you want to address uh, the issue, uh, do you agree with uh, Ripplinger's book, New Age Bible Versions? Just speaking now. This is Dale. I'm just posing... Uh, yeah. Phil's question. Well, I, I don't want to get into the the issue of that book. Uh, we're talking about the issues here. And uh, okay. but, but Dr. Wade, I, 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 if I could, please, uh, this uh, book I, is I, this book really the, is. One of the things that Dr. Mr. Wade. White and I agreed to before uh -huh. we began was that each of us would get an equal amount of time on every question. He took two and a half minutes, an answer, I wanted two and a half, and that's all I was trying to plead for. Oh, sure. I just uh, trying to direct the uh, question. 
Yeah, yeah but you need to and stick every to the. Can, can tell his list his mm. question, but I believe that I should get the equal amount of time to answer as I feel wisely to answer. Y just yes, like sir. Mr. White has the same amount of time. Yes, sir. I, I agree okay. completely. So if you'd like to address what the caller said about Gail Ripplinger's book, I think that would be great. But I think the objection that's being raised is you're going off onto an issue that no one raised. You're going off onto a readability issue. So I we're, think. We're I think as the head. The King James Bible, and I believe it's important to have equal time. Uh, I don't think that the, the personalities, whether it's Mr. Mars or whether it's Mrs. Ripplinger, uh, is a part of the issue that I was, but, was here to address. But what about the book, sir? The book is is uh, definitely representing the King James only perspective, the King James only position. Uh, certainly, your ministry has taken some. Uh, position on the validity of her arguments that uh, the NIV and the NASB are actually satanic translations that are specifically designed uh, to bring people into a one world government and lead them to worship Lucifer. Uh, how your, your ministry certainly has to take some stand as to whether that's true or false, doesn't it? Well, we believe that the King James Bible is superior to these other versions. Uh, the issue as to whether or not uh, the motivation is satanic or whether it is not uh, is a question that nobody knows except them, those people who have got it themselves. I believe it's something we cannot extrapolate. But uh, you may have other questioners. Go right ahead on your phones. And just so I have the same amount of time that uh, Mr. White has, that's certainly. what I'm contending for. Okay, certainly, Dr. Wright. All right, let's... At this point, there was a break on the recording that we received and some of the show material was lost and unfortunately the call that Wanda Mars made to the show to defend her husband's character against the claims made by a previous caller was in this segment. Wanda did speak for about a minute or so to defend against the charge that Tex Mars was a quote evil man end quote. And that's why it's good. Okay, very, uh, we're just about down to one or two minutes. So, uh, let, should we go to one more caller or just have conclusions? Let's have conclusions. Okay. Uh, Dr. Wade, would you like to go first or would you like me? Go ahead. Uh, well, I, I think we have seen uh, this evening, uh, as we have examined, uh, when we've been able to get to specifics, uh, there is really no reason to believe that the uh, King James Version uh, is superior in all respects to all of the translations or that the Textus Receptus underlies this New Testament is superior to all modern translations. We have seen uh, mistranslations in the KJV that have not been addressed and errors in the TR that have not been addressed. And so I, I, I feel that uh, those issues need to be addressed, and until they are, I don't believe that a person person can uh, tell someone else that they should uh, utilize the King James as their only translation. I think people should be able to utilize a number of different translations in their Bible study. Dr. Wade? All right. Uh, that was a short one. 40 seconds. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'll just sum up and simply say that every one of us is entitled to their own opinion, and I do not wish to force anyone to take an opinion on the King James Bible or the Text of Receptus or the Master of the Hebrew Text or any other matter that is contrary to their will and their wishes. I believe in freedom, and I believe that every one of us must be fully persuaded in our own minds. And I believe that we're the product of our backgrounds, we're the product of our research, of our studies, and some of us study one way, some another. And so I believe uh, still in defending our King James Bible as superior in its text, superior in its translators, its technique, and its theology. I'll have to stop there. That's my 40 seconds. Uh, Dr. Wade, I just wanted to thank you very much for agreeing to be on with me this evening, and I've very much appreciated your uh, uh, your demeanor, and uh, I just wanted to say that to you. Well, thank you, Mr. White. I appreciate your demeanor as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. White, for being on the program. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 